Oh, let's see. Where were we at? We were at 146,000 some odd monkeys the last show. And, you know, I think we're we're zeroing in on that 200,000 mark. Uh, it's got to be uh, getting up there a ways. Uh, you know, there's there's uh, more and more people that are are jumping on the bandwagon. You know, I saw I saw a, uh, a TV clip on YouTube today about it was actually from uh, RT Russia Today, and they were they were doing a show on or a segment on uh, the major media and how uh, so many people people are falling away from trusting and watching the the major media news outlets i got i got a story about that a friend of mine's um I, a friend of mine's his, uh, mother passed away a few months ago and not to go into their personal business but um the daily news did a story on it um because how how she died and completely just changed everything up to make the story juicier turned it into something that it wasn't and he was really pissed off, and I think for him that was like an awakening because he was like, "I will never touch the daily news unless it's to wipe my." Beep. There you go. <laughs> and um, yeah, a lot of people are realizing that the major media is really giving you BS. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's it's just really uh, it's a sign of the times, I and mean, we are. Uh, as as a collective human race, we are beginning to wake up and uh, realize that that there is, the propaganda that's being shoved down our throat isn't necessarily good for us. So that's yeah. very uh, that that's there. There we go again. The hundredth monkey strikes again. That that conscious wave is spreading across the planet, and and uh, people are starting to take responsibility for what they put into their brains. So yeah. this is all good stuff. All good uh, stuff. The, the other one is, um, uh, as far as the news section, we have one. Speaking of uh, not trusting the me news media, <laughs> uh, FBI UFO disclosure on Fox News uh, that came out. I think it's a little old, so most of you guys might have seen it, uh, July thirteenth. But it's all about um, some FBI agents talking about it back in the 1940s and being very open with what they saw um, as far as the news that's what I got for now but always check that we try to update it yeah. also um, let's see Tom will be uh, reading Tara at the uh, Cove Crystal Shelton Washington July 27 28 29 of 2012 uh, that's just the 28th and 29th oh okay 28th yeah 29th. I gotta yeah. fix that up then. And also, I will be on Truth Theorem Radio August first at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, learning how to advertise my book from our next <laughs> guest. Yeah. Um, also, uh, we have a link there for the uh, Pythagoras concert conference that's coming up in October. Uh, if you guys uh, want to go to that, uh, if you would be so kind as to purchase your tickets through our website that would uh, definitely help support us a bit we get a, a slice of that pie and uh, it would definitely help support Ramon and I and what we're doing here too so yeah and also you can find us on Facebook Twitter and uh, one more media uh, YouTube yeah 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 so just scroll down and you can link on all of that and yeah. let's see what else it, yeah so Speaking yeah, of, we 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 we've got it. We've got uh, a return guest tonight. We had uh, uh, Mr. Thomas Fusco on with us here a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he uh, has a pretty pretty intriguing theory. Uh, one of those uh, big toes theory of everything that uh, has some some uh, really re intriguing aspects to it, and we decided that we needed to jump dig into this a little bit deeper. And uh, tonight we're bringing on with him David Roundtree, and these two have been working together on uh, this theory and uh, proving out some of the, uh, doing some of the, the, well, actually, you know, before I slaughter the explanation of what they're doing, I think I'll go ahead and bring these guys in. 
and uh, let them explain it to you. Uh, welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio, uh, David and Thomas. Hey, thanks for having us. So let's uh, dig into David's uh, past a little bit. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, David. Oh, I've been doing paranormal research for over 35 years. Uh, started in 1976. Uh, have been coming at it pretty much totally from the approach of, of a scientific point of view. Uh, really started making some decent breakthroughs and discoveries uh, pretty much right after 2002. Um, and pretty much uh, still kicking at it, still doing it, self-funded, uh, working out of New Jersey. Okay, and uh, while uh, but while we get started here, in case people want to uh, check out uh, your website while we are doing this, uh, con- having this conversation, it is uh, spirit or spinvestigations.org. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, Thomas's website is Cosmic Veil. That's v e i l dot com. Uh, so you guys can uh, check in on their sites, poke around there while we're we're conversating. <laughs> I I also have to uh, give a congratulations to Thomas. I think he's broken the record for uh, most interviewed. <laughs> oh yeah, def- uh, at least at least in our genres. He's definitely been out there uh, uh, spreading his word. So uh, to. Get started with this show, and to bring everybody who may not have heard the last show up to speed, Thomas, would you could you give us a, a kind of a brief overview of your uh, what what was it uh, bio bio geometrics or super geometrics? Yes, um, uh, early in my uh, life, uh, late teens, early twenties, uh, I had uh, several different types of encounters experiences that caused me to call into question the model of the universe, the model of reality uh, that was taught to me in science and physics. And so for me, the compelling question became, uh, how is the universe put together that allows um, things that we call like the paranormal or the supernatural to take place, that these things, because they are observable, then they must be real physical effects, and if they are real physical effects, they must conform to the laws and principles that uh, by which the universe, the greater universe of which they're a part, is put together, and our current models uh, doesn't give us a very good insight into the mechanics behind this particular group of physical observations. And so that became the compelling question to me. And that's what uh, propelled me into that kind of research and theorizing until I finally arrived at a model that seems to answer those kinds of questions that are posed to it. Right. So, and I know this uh, this model is is probably uh, a little cumbersome to try to put in a nutshell, uh, and I, I know, and I would suggest everybody, uh, if you haven't listened to the first interview with Thomas, that you uh, you you would go back and listen to that uh, because there was just a, a a a ton of information that we shared, and uh, but could you kind of give us a a, a kind of a, a a broad overview of your toe, of your theory of everything? Yes. Um, And uh, the way that this relates actually to the paranormal, because I may have mentioned to you when I was on the air before, I myself am not a paranormal investigator. Um, It's just that the body of paranormal evidence is part of the greater cauldron of uh, physical observations. Uh, by which we have to accommodate uh, with a particular model right. uh, of the universe. And if I was going to try to really paraphrase it um, in as simple as possible terms, we have two very compelling mysteries that still confront us with understanding reality. Um, and they 
basically understanding the universe. The first one is is that we that physics is still not able to answer the question where did order come from in the universe? What ordered and structured the physical universe? We don't have a good explanation for that yet. And the other part of it is how that order is able to materialize, that is, become material, become physical, into the forms and structures that we see. So it really goes back to a very ancient uh, oriental philosophy in physics that has to do with, and it's called Wu Li. Uh, it's two words, and it has to, uh, has to do with form and structure. A- any ties to the, um, the book? I'm sorry? Uh, there's a... Um... Sorry, uh, I questioned that wrong. There's a book called Wu Li, and um, it's uh, this, um, he's a Qigong master, I forgot his name, from China, and he explains that, but he uses more of a of the physics, of the, he uses quantum physics, physics to explain it. Yeah. Have you read that before? No, uh, I'm just familiar with the, you know, the oriental uh philosophy behind their, uh, their particular system of physics. Of course, today the world is all under the Western model of physics for the most part. Uh, but the Oriental history of science is based on that idea of form and structure. But our physics today, Western physics, Western science, still struggles with these same fundamental ideas. Structure has to do with order. Order has to do with information. And everything is comprised of information. So we have not been able to answer the two compelling questions about the way reality is put together is, one, what is the source of that order and structure and information? And, two, how can it materialize into form, into structured form? And these are two of the compelling problems. And this is what my theory addresses. It goes right to the heart of this and speaks to how this can be. And then once getting that fundamental model, we can begin to take that model and apply it to areas where we previously have not been able to figure out answers, whether it be paranormal or otherwise. And then this model begins to shed light on what could possibly be the underlying causes of these other types of observations. Mm. So, uh, well, you know, I'm I'm not really exactly sure where I want to go with this right at the moment, but I know that we had talked about some some experiments, and, and we might as well get David jumped in here and. Uh, uh, Explain some of the experiments that you guys are doing to to actually validate this theory. Well, David, just just before David starts, uh, just want to let you know that David is the one who is doing the actual uh, muscle work, so to speak. He's the one that's actually doing the experiments and setting right. them up and designing the equipment. I happen to come along and meet him a number of months ago. And then when we shared notes, we found that my theoretical model actually predicts the kind of results that he's been getting with his experimentation. So as far as the actual footwork, so to speak, yeah, David would right. certainly want to I, – I will cede the, the podium to him because he's got some very interesting information to share. <laughs> so, so David sure. – uh, you know, I, this this stuff just absolutely fascinates me. Trying to, I mean, actually wrapping my head around how this whole reality of ours does work, and right. it really intrigues me that that uh, you know the that Thomas has you know come upon you the way he has, and what you're doing, and uh, I'm assuming that these experiments that you're doing are are repeatable with similar results 
uh, are, are reflecting uh, or validating his theory. Uh, would you would you uh, like to grab one and explain? Sure. Something? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I could just explain my personal journey and all this um, oh, to absolutely. probably put it into perspective. Um, it kind of really started for me when I first began looking at this. I was studying uh, electronic voice phenomena. This was back in, in 1976, like I said. And uh, back then, technology was pretty crude. I mean, uh, what was available to the um, armchair, pretty much um, uh, non-scientifically institutionalized related person doing research into the paranormal was pretty grim. So right. um, I had postulated back then that EVP was not sound that it had nothing to do with sound whatsoever and that it was probably being caused by uh, EMF, electromagnetic fields, in the audio spectrum. But, of course, I couldn't prove that back then. Um, what I was able to prove is that uh, EVP was not sound. And how I did that was by using a bell jar, suspending a mic inside of a bell jar microphone and va vacating all the air, all the medium from inside the jar, and still being able to record or pick up EVP. So I could prove that it wasn't sound, but that wasn't really definitive proof that it was EMF. Um, it was just proof that it was something else. EMF, of course, right. was a big, a big uh, uh, target, uh, uh, you know, explanation. But I couldn't physically prove it. I didn't have the technology available to me, uh, or the equipment, or anything else. Um, so for many, many years, I just gathered evidence. And like I say, after 2001, um, I had a better paying job, which allowed me to spend a little more money on equipment, get some specialized software, and I began to seriously go after the whole EVP issue. And of course, I did finally discover that EVP was indeed being caused by EMF. That was the first major discovery. And that discovery really was the hinge pin on everything else that I've discovered since then. Because after I discovered, hey, it's EMF that's causing this, the next question, of course, was, okay, where's the EMF coming from? So um, I had to build a fairly elaborate device in order to uh, locate the source for the EMF. And I suspected that it was an emerging property. In other words, that it was emerging into our environment in a very localized, uh, very localized situation. Um, from a point unknown beyond our reality or our, our perception. Um, so serious study and uh, a couple of years later proved that, yes, indeed, in fact, EVP was emerging into the environment, and it was emerging as EMF, and it was emerging in a very localized area uh, of a room. In fact, the area of effect, or what I would later term a paranormal event horizon, uh, was uh, no larger than maybe two meters in size and often much smaller. So literally, you could be in a room that had paranormal activity occurring, and if you weren't located physically in the right place in the room, you'd never know what was going on. I mean, it was just that localized an effect. Um, and locating this, what I call a paranormal event horizon, I began to throw a lot of equipment into that area to try to do some type of meta-analysis of that uh, anomalous region that, as it would occur. And what I was actually finding was very interesting. I was finding um, things such as, first of all, this emergence of EMF and all sorts of EMF, not just EVP EMF, but other low-frequency type EMF that didn't seem to have any uh, man-made source for it. The other thing we were noticing were there were temperature fluctuations, mostly temperature drops, uh, drops in barometric pressure, very localized drops just in the area that we call the paranormal event horizon, which, of course, in a, someone's living room, to have a small region that suddenly has a lower atmospheric pressure than every place else in the room is, is pretty hard to explain. Mm -hmm. um, we had drops in, in relative humidity. We had uh, dramatic increases in... Um, uh, static energy. We had dramatic increases uh, in ion counts. We had emerging bursts of gamma radiation that were fairly high level. Uh, we had time fluctuations in which time was actually altering its speed of flow. Uh, we had uh, gravity fluctuations, not just uh, gravity from the Earth, but along three different axes 
we had gravity fluctuations. So uh, all of these things, and there were other 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 things that we measured as well, but all of these things began pointing me to uh, a very, very narrow margin of, of cause and effect for this type of phenomena. Um, and where I had come at it from was, I had come out at it from as it being some type of wormhole connection that was occurring, um, potentially between our universe and an adjacent universe of some kind that was probably based on pure energy instead of energy and matter like our own was. Um, and uh, that was pretty much where I was coming from when I met uh, Thomas. Now, interestingly, Thomas's theory, um, everything that we believe, Thomas and I, is, is pure, right up to the point of source. In other words, we're in total agreement from the point of emergence onward. Um, where we currently disagree is the actual source. Like I say, I believe that it's uh, a wormhole conduit connecting. Uh, because I have another adjacent theory that I'm working on that's a multiverse theory based on uh, uh, alternative universes being created within a black hole. Okay. Um, but that's another completely you know, different thing that uh, uh, has to do more with physics than it does with the paranormal, but it does offer a potential uh, paranormal connection with that. Where Thomas uh, believes that it's a localized bending of space-time and that it becomes from these uh, exposing of these bubbles of dimensions kind of thing. And the interesting thing is, is that either his explanation or mine will create the same effects. So literally, the effects are telling us that it's one or the other of these sources. And, uh, you know, it could even be combinations of both. We just don't know. Um, so the point is now is, is that we're, we're working on eventually eliminating one of the sources or confirming one of the sources uh, in some manner of experimentation that would allow us to, to get a full, a full um, connection between source point and uh, manifestation so that we would have a complete and known uh, part of the theory. Um, and, yeah, my experiments are, are – the stuff that I do is posted on my website. Um, I outline uh, each type of apparatus that we use and how you can put it together with, you know, pretty much off-the-shelf stuff that you buy, how to put it together, how to use it. And uh, we have had uh, some groups out there who have been brave enough to do that and are reporting very similar uh, findings to what we have been finding. So uh, it's kind of exciting right now because I think that uh, both Thomas and I are on the threshold of putting a real finite theory into stone on the paranormal, hmm. amongst it, other things. Here's a question for you. Uh, have you noticed that there is anything that will facilitate that event horizon to uh, activate in any specific locations? Well, I, we're working on that because obviously if something is being created or is being um, manifested, then there should be a way to artificially stimulate that action to occur. Um, what I'm looking at, if, it's, if I am right and it is uh, related to wormhole activity, then what has to occur is for the uh, resonance of the wormhole to occur. In other words, to create a artificial resonance that would allow that wormhole to form. Um, that's something that we're looking at. Uh, it's also probably one of the hardest things to discover because it's pretty much like looking for a frequency in an infinite scale of frequencies. Right. So it's right. like looking for a needle in a haystack right now. However, I, I'm doing a parallel study on psychics and mediums. And I believe that the mechanics of how a psychic and medium works is very similar to these event horizons that we have. In other words, I have measured emerging EMF when psychics and mediums are getting their information. Um, so I'm thinking that there is something in the mechanics of how a psychic or a medium operates that could generate this local resonance or whatever the precondition is that allows this um, information conduit to open up. And uh, so, like, for the rest of the night, I will refer to it, like, as an information conduit because that way, no matter what it turns out to be the source, the description is at least accurate because what's happening here is something is opening up that allows the flow of information. Um, either we are witnessing information or we are picking it up as a psychic medium and relating that in very specific means to, to someone else. So uh, something is happening when a psychic does their thing 
that opens up that information highway, opens up that conduit. So I'm hoping that by studying how the psychic medium mechanics work, that I may be able to discover exactly what that mechanic is. Right, right. So here's, I have a few questions. Um, number one, when when the, because I, I've experienced it myself where I hear, you know, um, voices from from something or somebody, and I'm wondering, is it that they're, number one, are they tuning into your pineal gland, and that's why, for example, um, I can hear it, but Tom could be right next to me and not hear anything, but the other person can hear who's probably a little more sensitive. And the other one is, I'm wondering if they're, if they're using, like, if our pineal glands act like a, a radio station antenna. Uh, I'm sorry, like a radio receiver. And as... Um, let's say through meditation or whatever practice, we can tune into these different frequencies, and that's how some of us are able to pick up things easier. And the same as your equipment. Well, Do you understand what I mean? Or the, yeah, oh. well, there's a lot of things that are in play here. Um, there's there's several different types of phenomena. Number one, there's there's electronic voice phenomena, which is EMF emerging. Um, some people are sensitive to it. Some people can receive it, so to speak. Uh, we have noticed that the information carrier wave that emerges, the EMF carrier wave, tends to be somewhere between 2 hertz and 6 hertz. So it's a very low frequency uh, carrier. Um, we also think it's also related to the level of magnetite that is in the human brain, depending on how sensitive a person may be. Um, but there's also another phenomenon that's called what I call acoustic voice phenomena, which is mechanical energy uh, that you can hear that has to be created by physical mass moving a compression wave in the air. Um, uh, most paranormal investigators have experienced an acoustic voice phenomena of some kind. Um, they can be very localized, uh, basically because it has a proximity effect. Uh, just like the EMF uh, EVP does. It has a very, very small proximity effect because there's nothing very large making this sound. If it was, you would see it. You would visually be able to notice something bizarre around you creating this sound. So whatever is occurring is happening at a fairly small size as far as moving air. Um, but I have been in a crowd where two or three people were sitting together or working together very closely, and everyone in the group heard it. So there's another type of phenomena that I call acoustic voice phenomena, which is occurring. And like I say, that has to be uh, created by um, a compression wave in the actual atmosphere being created, which would require mass of some kind. That uh, or that or they would all be in that two-meter area that you spoke of earlier. Right, it would have to be emerging from that two-meter area and assuming that the medium within that uh, area was uh, conducive to a compression wave formation and transmission. So, yeah, you're right. It would have to be either within that hidden realm or in, in the case of what Thomas is, 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 is uh, pushing forward with his, his source theory, it would have to be within the bubble. The source would be in the bubble, and yet it would be able to produce a compression wave that could radiate outwards into our own environment. Um, there's some interesting things about um, uh, the wormhole aspect I just wanted to touch base on because I'm sure Tom is going to go into his aspect of it, and rightly so. Um, a wormhole has an adjacent uh, or an associated uh, uh, holographic boundary. Uh, this holographic boundary could very well be t a type of projection screen in which uh, intelligent energy such as uh, bodyless consciousness could literally manifest a visual representation on that holographic boundary. Um, and it may very well be that a ghost might simply just be a manifestation of that energy manipulating that holographic boundary to create that projection, um, which would explain uh, a lot about how a ghostly uh, apparition looks. Uh, if you've ever seen uh, a holograph or a holographic display, uh, they tend to be kind of see-through. Right. They tend to be kind of whimsical in their appearance. Uh, they don't tend to be totally solidified when you see them. 
and, I, and, and there are some good holographic projections that are very close to reality, uh, but there's still a little something about them that's odd. And most of the people that have a visual experience will say that, you know, they knew it was a ghost or there was something just kind of odd about it, even if it looked like it was solid. Um, so I think there's some there's some meat to that, uh, that that should be explored. And I also think that uh, the condition that we call a um, residual haunt uh, may literally be where you are lined up perfectly in front of that flat screen TV to the point of where you're not just seeing something play over and over again that's in memory in the rocks, which I find to be, you know, just ludicrous because there's no evidence to support it. Uh, but instead, you're literally looking through the wormhole uh, to the historical event as it's unfolding because a wormhole also will connect two places in time. All right. It is a, a space-time construct. So it could very well be that people that are out there on the battlefield at Gettysburg just, you know, and I've heard this from people, one person is seeing this whole battle take place in front of him, and a person five feet to the right of him doesn't see anything. And it could literally be that that person was just physically lined up in the right position to see down the throat of that wormhole and look back into history and see that. So there there are interesting aspects of it that offer, as well, uh, explanations for other aspects uh, of the paranormal. It's not just like a one a one-pony show. Um, and and uh, Thomas's theory is the same way. The paranormal is just one small aspect of what his, his theory encompasses. Right. Um, I just happen to be fascinated with that aspect of his theory. So Thomas, let's uh, let's hear uh, your input on that that aspect. Well, my uh, my position starts from a very uh, universal point of view. Uh, which is how do we look at the universe, how do we look at reality in a way that helps us embrace and encompass all observable phenomena, including the paranormal. And what I liken this to, and I might have mentioned this on the, on the last show, was imagining uh, coming upon and discovering the Pyramid of Giza, and uh, instead of being completely assembled, it was scattered around in all of its two million stones uh, over the plains of Giza. And furthermore, imagine that there were no other pyramids in the world that we could figure out from looking at another structure how that great pyramid was put together. Now, imagine further that each stone if you were standing on every single one of these stones, each individual stone would give you a unique perspective out over the plains of Giza and all of the stones that were laid out upon it. Every stone that you stood on and looked out would give you a different perspective. Looking at reality is like that. And looking at paranormal phenomena is very much like that. Also, that when you take different perspectives, you see different things. Uh, but my point was to say, what stone could I look at that would give me the best ideas how all these mo many, many pieces of reality might come together and fit correctly? Right. And what I was looking for, obviously, is the capstone. Because the capstone is not only the very top stone, but it's also shaped like the pyramid. Find that stone, and all the other blocks fit underneath in their proper place. They have, the whole structure comes together conceptually. So for me, that capstone was, uh, for reality, was to see the universe as an expression of materialized, in other words, made physical, and by physical, we mean the realm of space-time, matter and energy. All of that is physical. Space is physical. Time is physical. And its content, what Einstein called its physical content, uh, matter and energy is all physical. And so the whole universe is an expression of information materialized and materializing into what is physical. 
Now, when you stand at that place, a funny thing happens. When you take a look at paranormal phenomena, you look at it and say, oh, what we're seeing is materializing and dematerializing information. Everything in the universe is assembled from information. In fact, uh, this has become such a compelling idea that the laws of conservation of matter and energy uh, that we were taught in school, that matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. That's, those are the laws of conservation. Modern physics has added a extension to that called quantum unitarity. And that says that information itself from which matter and energy is created, is assembled, cannot be created nor destroyed either. So here we have information being a fundamental constituent of the universe. What we need to do from that point, once you look at the universe from that perspective, then the next step is to figure out what mechanism allows information to materialize in the physical reality. The idea of a body of information uh, that is not yet physical, but defines the physical, is very old. Uh, it goes back to Plato's forms. Um, the Bible mentions a concept just like that. Uh, the original Greek in the first paragraph of the Gospel of John uses the Greek word logos, which means mind, thought, order, matrix, uh, structure. Uh, in the 20th century, we have um, David Bohm, physicist David Bohm, which called it implicate order. He said that this was the body of information, coherent information, which was not physical itself but gave rise to the physical universe, which he called explicate order. Um, a lot of people who are into the parapsychological uh, uh, field are familiar with Edgar Cayce. He called it the Akasha, or the Akashic Record. This was where he said not only the information about what was the medical state of somebody thousands of miles removed from him, not only did that information come to him from this source outside of space-time, but also the, the cure, the information for the cure, which if you think about it, did not yet exist in physical reality because the only thing that existed was the person who was sick. The cure did not yet had not yet materialized in the physical reality, yet the information for the cure was still there. And so when we start looking at it this way, we then take a look at paranormal phenomena, and we say, here's an example of information that is materializing. Now, the second part of my model is what is the mechanism that causes this to materialize? So here's where we get into this idea of form and structure. And what, I, what my model says, which is basically a superphysical extension of Einsteinian space-time, of his continuous field, is that the mechanism by which information can materialize in the physical form into our realm in space-time would create certain local effects. In other words, when these, this mechanism started uh, uh, engaging and working, it would create certain effects in the local space where that information was going to materialize. And those effects would be observable and they would be measurable and they would have specific characteristics that they would do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Um, and so my model makes a prediction that at the emergent point, 
of materializing information into our physical realm, we will be able to detect and measure certain types of effects as the environment is changing by this mechanism that's bringing this information in and materializing it locally in front of us. And those very effects are the ones that David has been finding in his experiments. So can, can you uh, give us uh, the broad description of some of these effects that are, uh, are predicted? Absolutely. Um, my model says that all matter, all physical content, we're going to say it as very broadly as Einstein said it, and he was saying anything physical, matter, energy, uh, whatever it was, um, materializes inside of the bends of space. So my model gives an exact opposite model of what current scientific thought says. Um, that instead of matter bending space, it is matter that forms inside of the bends of space. And the bends of space are occurring from outside of space-time. So here's what would happen. Let's say we have a bubble of space-time open up locally, like in front of you in a room in a haunted house very similar to what David's saying, is say, imagine if the mouth of a wormhole opened up locally in front of you. It would bend space. It would cause a spherical swelling, a bubble in space-time. Just like what I say, I compare it to a rubber, the surface of a, an old rubber inner tube that has a weak spot, that if you filled it with air, that weak spot would swell up and form a bubble there, almost comically looking. Imagine if that happened. One of the things it would do is it would compress the physical content immediately surrounding that sphere. And, of course, if it happened in mid-air, so to speak, the physical content around that bending would be air. It would be the actual molecules and atoms that comprise the gases of the air in which this occupies. <clears throat> now, imagine if information dropped down from another source. Now, like what David said, that he, his model says that information is coming to us via a wormhole type of a conduit, the, under, the other end is uh, connected to an adjacent universe that comprises of energy and that the information is coming into this emergence point in our local uh, space-time from that source. I say that the information is coming to us from this Akasha, from this implicate order that David Bohm spoke of, from what I call supergeometry, which is a superstructure on top of our space-time, but it exists above space and time, yet it still has the information in it that dictates the way that the universe is put together. So take my source of information or David's source of information, either one, drop it down into this bubble of space-time. And I need to interject that David's model of a wormhole is based on an Einstein-Rosen bridge between two physical sources. Um, when you see these funnels on your, the science fiction of wormholes opening up, that's almost like a two-dimensional expression of it. Yes, the opening of a wormhole in Einstein Rosen bridge in three dimensional space should take the form of a sphere. Yes. Identical to the form that I'm describing. Now, if we imagine the information dropping into that, and as soon as it enters into space time from above it, 
it begins to materialize inside of this ball of, of space. Let's say, for example, that information has to do with a vocalization. Let's say it is a disembodied intelligence that is speaking information. Just like on a computer hard drive, when it plays a song off the hard drive, that song isn't recorded on that hard drive in frequency and amplitude. It's recorded in digital information that the computer converts into analog sound. You follow what I'm saying so far? Yeah. I'm okay. following. Now, imagine this, this, this sphere of open space-time acting like a computer in that it can take this information and materialize it into a, a measurable uh, sound or a measurable uh, uh, observation in our physical reality. What would happen in my model is that it would begin to conform this bubble according to the shape of its information, which means that the surface of the space-time bubble will begin to vibrate at the frequency and amplitude of this materializing information. Because that space-time bubble is in direct contact with the air, with the physical content, the actual surface of the bubble acts like a speaker and it vibrates the air. And so from that moment on, the physical effect is identical to normal sound that would be coming out of a speaker on your stereo. The difference is instead of having the paper in your speaker vibrating the air, it's actually the surface of space itself that's acting as the surface of the speaker that's vibrating, and you get what, what David calls acoustic voice phenomena, literally out of thin air, because the face of space-time itself is acting as the speaker. So that's how my model explains one of the many paranormal phenomena that it does. So with that, uh, I'm wondering, because... Let's say we have a, a being or a ghost in the room and we're all sitting in the room. Is it their their aura maybe that is acting as the bubble that is a, allowing them? Well, you're, you're, you're taking something and you're putting it into an area of super reality, uh, which doesn't exist. Um, what we're trying to do is take uh, the things that we are witnessing and fit them nicely into the laws of physics, which makes way more sense than trying to prove something that we have no real evidence for. There's no real evidence of an aura. That's one of the problems that has faced scientific researchers for many, many years, is that uh, to date, no one has physically measured an aura around a human being. We have discovered bioenergy and biofield uh, emanations, but you know, to date, this whole concept of an aura is, is like the, the magic card trick at, at the circus. I mean, we haven't been able to locate it, nor have we been able to identify a vital life source, um, which if you read most of these New Age um, health sites where they're spouting all these quantum theories to support some of the nonsense they're coming up with, um, oh they would God. have you believe other otherwise. Uh, but part of the problems with holistic health is is that they uh, they lean pretty heavily on uh, terms that they don't fully understand. One of the things I wanted to add to Thomas's description here, he is talking about how there is the information is pretty much like digital format. Um, if the universe is alive, and I believe that it is, I believe that the universe is a life form. Number one, um, that energy. Uh, is turning in the, turning that information from digital information into, uh, in this case, acoustical information, simply by uh, quantum computing. In other words, atoms processing the energy, and these atoms would process this this information and convert it 
from its digital format, which, I mean, he calls it the Akashic Records. I call it the Zero Point Grid. Um, pretty much we're talking about the same right. thing. It's, it's, it's an information network that permeates through space-time. Right. Um, and if there's multiple universes, it permeates through multiple universes because it's something that's there all the time, and it's the thread that reality is hung upon. Um, but if this be the case, then the actual mechanism that would convert that information to its acoustic energy would be quantum computing, which would be occurring through the interaction of the atoms in the environment processing that information. And that's not very far-fetched. There was just a, an episode of Through the Wormhole on the other day that actually demonstrated uh, that uh, from the people that are researching quantum computing and trying to build the first quantum computer. Um, so the reality of this is, is that our universe may be a living being. You know, it may be a living being amongst many living beings of their kind. And as such, um, we are part or hosts within that living being. We are part of uh, a larger uh, uh, mechanism or part of a larger, uh, you know, type of organism. Uh, and as such, we will still be looking at real laws of physical manifestation and real laws of physics to explain what we are perceiving as supernatural, when in fact it's not supernatural at all. It's just natural that we haven't understood yet or come right. up with the definitions right. to explain it yet. So uh, it, it seems to me like uh, to really nail this down and understand what that what is truly happening in, during these phenomena, uh, that you, that you would almost need to have uh, or understand what the primary cause is. Uh, you know, is the, it, does consciousness have an, has have a play a key role here? Uh, oh, I think it does. I think you you have to include consciousness in any equation that you use with this type of manifestation, regardless of what branch of science you're using. In quantum mechanics, we have this thing called the observer effect, where in that uh, you have two types of, you have a, a matter that can, can manifest itself in two ways, a wave or a particle. And until it's literally locked down in a location and measured by the observer, it's really just uh, you're, you're dealing with probability. You know, you don't have anything locked in concrete and the, and the field doesn't collapse until the human element inserts the measurement device and then firmly locks it in its location and in its state. So uh, any type of science that you use, there are rules within that science that would govern that. And the consciousness is part of that human element. It's part of that observer effect. And there's this whole thing with the power of intent, with uh, the work that the, the, the peer lab did at Princeton University, in which human intention can actually affect the environment, can actually affect matter can can uh, these are the kind of things that you have to keep in the equation because how much of it is being um, uh, stimulated by the individual right and their intent in that environment and how much is it is something naturally occurring you know it may very well be that uh, there are people that are oh they're just built right to cause these things or to help these things form or to help these things come into being or to create. And so these people may be a catalyst, which also has to be studied. I mean, there are so many aspects of this that need to be put under the microscope. And it's, this is why there is a desperate need uh, for there to be funded research hmm. in this field. I mean, because there are so many things going on uh, I believe, number one, they will never find the grand theory of any, everything in physics until they fully understand what's going on in this metaphysical environment. It, it, uh, it has to be both. You know, they have to be able to understand what's going on there and quit turning their back on it because there are quantum effects occurring in this metaphysical environment. Uh, these things that, that we are saying are hauntings or UFOs, they, they are saturated with quantum effects at a macro level. So until science gets off its behind and seriously takes a look at this stuff again and doesn't just dismiss it outright as being hocus-pocus, um, they're missing the boat on a very key part of physics and on several key explanations in physics. Um, and this is primarily the reason why right now quantum physicists are very interested in the study of the paranormal because they are picking up on the fact that we are observing uh, quantum effects at a macro level uh, in the study uh, of this phenomena. Um, 
and I'm not going to predict what is what here, uh, you know, but I'm just saying, in order to have a grand theory of everything, you really have to unite these two areas uh, and, and understand what is really at play here. Um, I suspect that everything we are dealing with has a firm root in, in physical science. Uh, you know, I think they're, they're quantum mechanics are standard or the standard model. So, you know, they've got to do it. They've got to unite the two in order to to come up with a grand theory of everything, and that's why they haven't done it to date. Yeah. Well, I kind of I kind of have a question on whether or not you know, it's the the proverbial drop of water in the ocean. Are you aware of the whole ocean as being a drop of water? Us being here enmeshed so so completely within this environment, in this reality, are we re really going to be able to see this whole reality, understand this reality from being the, the, the little dro the drop in the ocean? Well, well I, I think, think that uh, if, uh, I don't know, I was going to jump in and address that. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, all right. Um, first of all, uh, um, what I wanted to add to what David was saying, is that what has not driven, compelled physics in, in its mainstream form to begin to openly look at the paranormal was a lack of a scientific model that was not only consistent with scientific thought, but at the same time made testable predictions and also offered explanations to certain scientific anomalies that have thwarted conventional physics from finding answers. This is what David and my work together has been the first at doing. This has very, never very good point. We now have something where, as I say very colloquially, rather than trying to call the people in the physics arena to say, please come over to our arena and play and join us and all this. We can take this, go into their stadium, into their arena, by their rules, on their home turf, and give them a black eye. Yeah. Now they can't ignore us because we can knock them out on their home turf. That's probably a very crude way of saying it, but a lot of but, times... But essentially, even, that's, that's the mechanics of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, very sophisticated human behavior sometimes has very rudimentary foundations to it, you know, like, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, birds uh, puffing up their feathers or, you know, uh, wolves well, in a pack scientific... finding a sticking order, that kind of thing. The scientific community thrives on conflict. Um, I just happen to subscribe to the fact that uh, I believe it's the scientific community's duty to investigate the unexplained and not explain the uninvestigated. And that's what this is all about. Yeah. Yes. What I say is that physics is the study of everything physical. And just because physicists, which is different than physics, you know, decides that they want to examine what's most comfortable to them and ignore other parts of physical reality that is not comfortable to them doesn't define what physics is. Physics is the study of everything physical, and paranormal uh, phenomena has physical effects, and so it falls under the category of physics, whether physicists are comfortable with that or not. That's right. Right. Yeah, that's very true. So we have reached the top of the hour. Oh, you're kidding me already? Yep. <laughs> Holy crap, that went quick. That's what happens <laughs> yeah, with the we're, rest of the guys. We're, we're actually like 59.30 seconds. Wow. <laughs> wow. That just blazed past. Okay. Well, that happens whenever we get into talking about something that, that I have a, a, a great interest in, and I'm sure everybody experiences that. So, Okay, well, then I guess we're going to have to pick this up in the, in the second half. Uh, uh, Thomas, uh, w would you uh, share your website with us real quick? 
Yes, once again, uh, related articles, my blog, uh, where I'm going to be appearing next. Your book. About the book and where to buy the book. www.cosmicveil, spell V-E-I-L, cosmicveil.com. Great. And David? It's uh, Mine is spininvestigations.org. That's spinvestigations.org. All right, everybody, I want to thank you for joining us for this first segment. And uh, uh, join us for the second half of this uh Amazing conversation. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. The love you deny is the pain you carry. Adios. <laughs>